And so our first presentation um, is going to be from Ryan Sievers uh, from Fickett Structural Solutions and David Crumley from Montana DOT. Hey, I am uh, Ryan Sievers with Fickett Structural Solutions, and I'm joined by Dave Crumley from MDT. Again, second presentation of the day. And we're talking about timber bridges, uh, some inspections we've been doing in Montana since 2019. So a little background is Montana was having some issues. Uh, Dave Crumley is going to go over the specific pile failures they had that were very costly for them prior to 2019. And they were also getting some inconsistent data from their timber bridges, uh, which was having some issues with load rating. So they would have to go back to the bridges to confirm girder defects. So they put all of the on-system timber bridges to the consultants to get some more consistent data. Uh, this project started in 2019. So in 2019 and 2020, we inspected the 440 timber bridges owned by Montana. I don't think we did all of them. It was just the on-system and some off-system that it first year. Everything MDT owned. It was everything? Yeah. Okay, so it was everything in the first two years. We did about a third of the bridges in 2019 and the remaining two-thirds in 2020. These first two years, we drilled everything with resistographs. So we drilled all piles at the ground line or water line, and we drilled all caps between 12 and 48 inches from each end to collect that data, drilled everything, and then moving forward, so from 2021 on, we had to do 10% of piles and then verify all previous decay. Oh, yeah, so this is what, so this is somebody having to go out to drill one of the piles out on the bents. So there are some times where you have to get creative. We've used rope access, a lot of ladder work. We've used inflatable boats, just about anything you can to get to the caps, which has been the most difficult, difficult issue. Uh, issues with inspection. Uh, that first year, I believe one consultant had issues getting under contract, so they couldn't get out and do, these, do this work until November and December. And I think they even did some in January. And at that point in Montana, everything's frozen over. So it's pretty hard to do any sort of timber boring uh, during the winter, and we even ran into that. I have a photo on the, oh, this photo right here, where we went out in October and they were hit with an early blizzard, so we had to crack through a quarter inch of ice just so we could go out there, uh, make sure everything was right with the piles, and do all the borings. It's not the most fun. Nomenclature between different firms that first couple years, they, we worked from 2019 to 2020 in creating guidance. We didn't really have that at first, so people were still calling things different than what they wanted. But moving forward, I think we've gotten pretty consistent, specifically with girder defects. And also there's some issues with just using the resistographs. It was my first job using a resistograph, and I think it was for some of the other consultants. So just learning how to use that device and interpret the data. So for the resistographs, so prior to 2019, I don't know if any of you have used incremental borers, but they'll actually take a quarter inch diameter section out of a timber pile or timber member so you can physically see the decay. Uh, since then, things have moved over to manual resistographs, and I've seen one resistograph with paper printout. That's one of these right here, um, and it, we have a video that shows how these resistographs work on the next slide, and now we've been using digital resistographs. Three. So to collect a bulk amount of the data, we use this, it's the IML MD300. I believe there's other resistograph companies, but we've used IML. So this is all just off inspector judgment. You take any electric drill, and as you can see, it slips right there, and there's a ruler on the side. And that's how we collect how much decay we're finding in the center of that pile. And we've done a whole lot of uh, checking between this and our digital, and I've found that you can get about a, within a half inch of what the decay is just by, use, just by going off feel. So it's, it's pretty accurate. It does take a little bit of practice. One big issue is catching checks on the back side of piles, it can feel like decay, so it's just interpreting that data. Here's the same pile with our digital resistograph. Uh, as you can tell, it is way slower. That's the main draw drawback, but it does create a digital file that we can put into the inspection report that shows what we found on that day. Yeah, so it's quite a long video. And then I zoom in and it shows exactly the four or five inches of decay in the center of this wing wall pile. Uh, another big difference is this digital resistograph is about $10,000, and the, the manual one is 1000 So we try to do a majority of our boring with those manual ones, and we'll still burn out two of those per year. So we try to use this digital resistograph only when we need to create a digital file. Yeah, so that's how long it took for a single bore.
than this. Yep, so then that shows that the dead zone in the middle is showing that dirt. five to six inches of decay. I'm gonna kind of skip through, we, there's a section here on the caps and what we found for the caps, but most of what Dave's talking about is with pile, um, all the pile repairs. So I'm gonna go quickly through the caps, but we did find some pretty widespread damage in the caps, some of, most of which wasn't called out previously. So this shows the 2019 data, which is the red lines, versus what we found in 2021. So doing more pattern drilling, so you can get a three-dimensional view of what that cap looks like and what the decay is. So as you can see with this, there's 90 to 95% decay during sections of this. And I, I'm not sure on this one, but sometimes, yeah, there'll be no bulging. And even when you hammer sound, you can't really even hear it. It's difficult to even hear. And this is what the digital printout looks like that we would attach to the report. And then this is the, the photo of what that abutment looked like. And you can see all the markers. So the red is everywhere that we found decay and green is everywhere that we found no decay. So here is all the information that, this is just Fickett's information. There's been three, four consultants now that have been on this project. This is just our data. So overall, we found 4% of all piles have had decay, and it's a pretty even distribution between CS2, 3, and 4, and that is the left graph. On the right graph, we found about 9% of caps have some level of decay. Uh, the big thing you'll notice is in 2019, it's, we put a lot into CS3. After 2019, we got more guidance on what they wanted for CS4, and that kicked a lot of it into CS4, which is why a majority of it went, went that direction after 2019. And what this is showing is the left column is prior to 2019, what was found with hammer sounding versus what we found that year on those bridges based off percentage. I did manipulate the data. There were a handful of bridges where the previous inspector would say every pile had CS3 decay and that really skewed all of, the, all of our information. So I removed those, because they would say 25 piles with decay and we'd find one. So I did remove those. But what you'll see is, I think it, it, we, have, we found four times as many piles as what was previously found before 2019. And with caps, was it specifically? They had four caps in CS4 decay in total of the four years of data we have, and we found 71 caps so far with some level of decay. So there, yeah, we found a significant amount, of, about four times as much with the resistograph in comparison to hammer sounding. And with that, we'll go to the repairs. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, so what are we doing with all this information, and why did we, why did we go to all this effort? Well, uh, as Ryan kind of showed there, the more you look, the more you're going to find if you've got a number of timber bridges out there. Uh, basic, you know, visual and sounding methods just can't locate um, you know, the rot, like, like one of these uh, kind of semi-destructive um, tests can. Um, we had a lot of, of maintenance issues, a lot of catastrophic failures. Everything was due to piles. That's, what, that's what's driving all of our failures. So around 2017, we started trying to come up with ways to try to get ahead of some of these, these failures and a lot of the maintenance that was having to go on with these piles. Um, Montana had, at the time, about that time we had about 450 bridges uh, that we owned. We're down to about 410 or so now, and about 230 of those are on system. Um, they, uh, the oldest was built in 1925, and probably right around 75% of them were built before 1950. So that puts the average age at somewhere around 75, 80 years old. So we, we our timber bridges are, are tired, I guess, to, to, to put it mildly. So um, we're trying to get ahead of, of, of all of these issues by going out and really trying to identify um, where all of the, 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 the issues are in our piles that are driving all our failures. So, so when we started putting together these two contracts, one for repairs and one for the inspections, we knew it would be a couple of cycles before we had all the information in from the resistograph. So, so we, we kind of worked on them simultaneously and went ahead and went out with a, with a repair project on the piles that we knew we had issues with, the ones that were already identified in condition state four. Um, we, we limited the, the project to uh, MDT owned bridges. We concentrated on condition state four piles that we knew about. If we were already working at the bridge, we would, we would pick up the condition state three piles there. Um, so the idea was to come up with some kind of a flexible repair system. We, we made the specifications pretty generic. Um, 
All of our piles in Montana are around 12 inches plus or minus, but there's a, there's a fairly widespread down, to, you, know, you know, from nine, 10 inches all the way up to 14 inches. Um, we also have some uh, maintenance repairs that were done, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago that um, used, you know, the, the kind of heavy maintenance method of using steel culverts and, and concrete filling of the annular space to, to uh, uh, do the repairs. We wanted to have something that could actually encase those because we, we assumed that those repairs were probably not meant to be, uh, you know, permanent. And so jacketing those also would be advantageous and, and hopefully uh, buy us more time. The other thing is we needed something that was flexible in length because not every pile was going to be the same length. And if we didn't come up with something flexible, we would end up having to specify specific jackets for every specific pile that we did. And we didn't want to get kind of go to that, um, that, that amount of effort. Um, so once we identified the bridges that had condition state four piles, we physically went out to every bridge and marked the piles took pictures, we uh, took a lot of measurements as far as uh, we, we noted how high the, 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 we wanted the jacket to go, we measured the pile widths or the diameters, we noted um, uh, how, high, uh, how far above uh, the water surface or the mud line needed to, uh, the pile needed to be, how far below we estimated below the water line or mud line. We also noted if there's any kind of attachment such as, uh, like this one has a rail, uh, there's a lot of cross bracing that had to be dealt with. Um, and the other thing is, is since we wanted something flexible, we, we put it out as a unit price contract, um, but we wanted to make sure that to take a lot of the risk off the contractor, we had our estimated quantities, but we put it out as a square foot unit price contract and we paid the contractor based on the final measured length and circumference. Um, so putting this out, we used the job order contracting method. Um, it was a very simple contract. We had um, basically three special provisions plus all the legalese that goes into a contract. Um, we had three details, um, one for abutment piles, one for pier piles, and then just a plan view. And then we had uh, a spreadsheet or what we called Exhibit A that had all that information that we'd measured in the field. And then we also uh, made available all the photos that we took of each individual pile. That helped the contractor um, assess, you know, what he was going to be dealing with at each individual pile, whether there's water, um, you know, the access, how high it was. It, it just, it kind of made things a little bit easier and gave them a little bit of peace of mind when they were, when they could do their planning. So the contractor chose Pile Medic. Um, it, it's basically a FRP role that comes, I don't know how long the roles are, but there's, there's, you know, a lot of feet on there. You can do multiple piles with, with it, but they would basically cut whatever length of FRP they needed to wrap the pile two times, they would epoxy it back to itself. Um, and if they needed to go longer, they would uh, just add another, overlap it, add another um, a roll above the, the previous one. And then they would keep going until they got the, the length of jacket that they needed. The other thing was uh, the annular space. We specified that the contractor could only use a low viscosity epoxy. Um, the reason for that was to make it simple on our EPMs in the field. So they didn't have to choose between a cementitious product for the annular space and also the, um, the, the low viscosity epoxy would kind of seep into all of the, the checks and, and, and cracks in the, in, the, uh, in the pile and also um, any rot voids or anything in there. You get a nice solid um, you know, product when you're done, this, this confined by the jacket. Um, the one thing we did allow is if there was large rot voids that they found. They could clean that out and then dry pack uh, grout in there before they applied the jacket. Um, so basically the, the sequence of repair was uh, dig down one to four feet. Um, we would estimate typically, um, you know, probably two to three feet was our estimate. Sometimes they could go deeper. Four feet was probably the limit for safety. You get much deeper than that and, and there starts to be safety issues and um, uh, you know, it's just not practical from a lot, for a lot of reasons in, in the type of project we were trying to do here. Uh, but basically they would dig down using uh, hand tools mostly. Um, most of the time it wasn't conducive to bring even a Mini-X in, but they did do that a couple of times. Uh, they would encapsulate the rot with a jacket like we talked about before, um, put uh, zip ties to hold it in place until that epoxy cured. 
And depending on temperature, a lot of this all happened in one day. Um, and then they would go in and um, use an oaken rope to seal the bottom of the jacket, pour in some epoxy, let that set up. Sometimes that could happen quickly if the temperatures were right. Other times they'd have to come back the next day. And then they would fill the, uh, the annular space all the way to the top with that epoxy, and it would, it would seep into all of those checks and cracks and rock pockets. Um, occasionally it would settle out. Um, they would have to come back in and top it back off later that day or the next day. And, and they were pretty efficient. A lot of these bridges sometimes were close together, and so they could bounce back and forth between two, three, four bridges on the same corridor um, and, and get really efficient at doing multiple bridges over a three or four day span. You know, and they were, a lot of times if there was just one bridge by itself, they weren't there but two or three days. They could, if temperatures allowed, they could be in and out really quickly. This is what the final product looked like. Um, most everything looked like what you're seeing on the left, that six to eight foot pile wrap and, and you know, right at the ground line or water line and they would, they would uh, extend you know, down underneath the water or the, or the mud line, two, three, four feet. Um, occasionally you, we would need a 12, 16 or longer uh, wrap for the entire um, pile. Um, occasionally we had some that were up higher off the ground which posed access challenges but uh, they were able to get to those. Those were typically due to split piles or woodpecker um, voids, things like that. But things worked really well um, and in the end you know, this whole project was a four-year project. We ended up uh, spending about 2.2 million dollars on the whole project. Uh, as you can see we, some of the catastrophic failures we had that resulted in Exigency, project, exigency projects to replace the bridge. Um, those averaged out about $2 million. Um, you see there's one in 2019, that bridge, it had a failure, but it was already programmed for replacement, so we just moved it up in the program um, and did an emergency replacement. We already had most everything developed for that one. Instead of going in and jacketing the pile, we just moved the replacement up. But, but you can see um, we did 72 bridges over those four years, 168 total piles. Um, and you can see how the numbers work out there. If we you know, assuming we just save one emergency project, we easily paid for this project. Um, and we, we feel like we, you know, from a, and that doesn't account all the safety aspects that, that we might have uh, got, gained benefit from. So not to mention, um, you know, re reducing our in-house maintenance uh, efforts. So there was a lot of benefits to this. We feel like we got ahead of some of that. We bought some, some time for our timber bridges. We're hoping, uh, you know, we're being pretty aggressive about replacing. We're down to about 410 now. Um, we've got another 40 or so in the process that are in the step right now uh, that'll be replaced in the next uh, three, four, five years. So we're being really aggressive about trying to get rid of these timber bridges. But we've got so many, it's still going to be a 20 or 25 or 30 year process to get rid of them all. And, and you can imagine what we're going to be facing, you know, 10 or 20 years from now. So with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Ryan. Questions? Any questions? Yeah. How did you uh, encase the piles um, below, like the mud line or the water? Did you have to build a little copper dam or something? Um, no. They basically would get in, and it was a messy, messy job. These guys were, were in, um, you know, waders up to, you know, to, up to their chest, and, and they did the best they could. You know, the, the idea wasn't to go to every effort to try to get down. We were trying to take care of everything we could economically. If there's a couple of piles out there that we couldn't um, repair adequately, and that happened in a handful of cases, we did not, we assumed those were still kind of, we, we jacketed what we could, but we still assumed those were in a less than repaired condition. And so we just noted those in the inspection reports that those will have to be, you know, basically those just ended up being unrepairable to some extent, so. Any other questions? I can shout loud enough probably. What about environmental permitting for clearance? Were you able to obtain a blanket for all the sites or was that a word that didn't come up? No, it came up. It was, uh, yeah, absolutely it came up. So, and that was, that we did have some challenges on this proje project. Um, environmental was one of them. So what happened is we, in, we, when we started out on the first job order, we permitted each individual pile. Well, we found out as we started going along at a certain bridge, we were like, well, look, we're here, we might as well do this pile, even though, it's, you know, for some reason we didn't realize it was as bad. I, I would get out there and, you know, we'd clear debris away or, or I'd start just pecking away with a shovel or something. And, and so what we found out is it was a lot easier to, on the subsequent job orders, to um, have environmental. It didn't take any more effort 
on their part, but just to write in that we were going to repair potentially every pile at the bridge. And so while we were out there, if we found an issue, we already had the permit in hand. Um, you know, one of the other challenges we had was traffic control. With, with as rural as Montana is, there's, most of these bridges had, the roadways at these bridges had no shoulders. And so we had to change order a lot of traffic control in, and the contractor would just shut a lane down during the day so they could have a place to stage their, their work. But it was really easy. They had basically one big work truck um, and a couple of crew trucks, and that was it. Mobilization was very simple. And then for subsequent job orders, we just prorated that mobilization. Um, and we had three bridges in here. They bid on that. Um, the next job order had 10. It was just prorated out, and, and it worked really well. We, that was something we were a little nervous about, but it, it, it worked out really well. The, the, the traffic control was probably the biggest surprise to us, so it, it ended up costing us more than we thought. Dave, how do you guys uh, protect it against scour or impact of fire on these jackets? Uh, well, you can see, for instance, this one, this bridge um, had been jacketed about three months prior to this fire. This was in Denton out in the prairie. And December 1st, this bridge burned down. Um, you can see the pile wrap right there. It looks like it survived, but it didn't. You go touch that, and it just falls apart. But it, it doesn't really matter anyway. Once you have a, you know, the bridge was gone. So, so we're not worried about protecting them from fire. There's, there's, you got other issues, I think, if we, if we uh, get to that point. But for scour, um, we, we have a few timber bridges that are scour critical, but it's, it's not really a huge concern at this point. We were more worried. We're having so many failures just from rot that that's what we were trying to get ahead of. So um, if we have some issues, some damage from debris or scour, that's just, that's just part of it. I don't think the, the jacket would make any difference one way or the other. We'd still have damage with or without the jacket. So. Do you guys load rate these piles, and if so, did they end up a lot of controlling the rating of the structure and posting the bridges? Or the we typically don't load rate our substructures. If a pile is completely failed, then we will load rate the caps and see where we're at. But typically for that point, we're, our, we're in an emergency project. We typically will just shut a lane down, and then we'll be out there working like within a day or two. So. Um, with our in-house maintenance forces. We did have one that was identified, um, and that's what's great about a job order contract, is we had one emergency that was identified. The contractor was about uh, working about three or four hours away, called him up. He was literally, I found it about lunch that day. I was out with uh, one of our load rating uh, consultants, kind of calibrating them to load ratings, and happened to just find this pile that was, at, that was failed. And the uh, the contractor actually was there by 8 a.m. the next day and had that was that one picture, that one that's uh, that tall one right there. We found that and they were out there at 8 a.m. the next day and then three days later we had the road back open. So so they the nice thing is they're able to mobilize in. I mean you have so little to mobilize. You got three guys and you know two or three trucks and that's it. So, it did. so I'm guessing this is a common or this would be a uh, a standard fix to any pile that you find like this in your state now? Uh, except we don't have the, the contract open anymore. So as we go through the resistograph um, um, inspections, we're, we're identifying a few more that are in condition state four. So that's kind of the next thing is to probably put this out again shortly. So we'll have that uh, tool in our toolbox again to have those guys go out and do all this again. So in the meantime, we're doing, you know, we're, we've had to do some in house. So. Okay, thank you. If you guys have any more questions, you can meet them uh, at the cocktail hour after this session. Thanks. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.